The Dreadnought was the first all-big-gun battleship of the 20th century, and ushered in a new age of warship design. It was such a sea change, snurk snurk, that battleships afterwards were commonly called dreadnoughts regardless of their class or country of origin. Before the ship entered service, battleships followed a pretty standard design pattern. Two main gun turrets, each with two big guns, and then lots of secondary and tertiary guns in smaller calibres. At least, that's what same countries did. Some nations, like France, built absolute monstrosities so ugly you may want to cover your eyes for the next couple of seconds. Final warning. Yep, my eyes. They burn. Please, make it stop. Anyway, the idea was that you would fight at close range and could rain down lots of fire from your smaller guns, whilst your big guns would slowly punch holes in your enemy. However, technological advances meant that the bigger guns were getting more accurate at long range, further than you could hope to hit with the smaller guns. But only four main guns made adjusting the aim difficult, because there's a degree of randomness to any shot, and so you need quite a few shots to cancel this out and work out where you need to sh shoot to hit the enemy. Because of course, hitting the enemy is fairly important. Witness Exhibit A. So it was logical to put a lot of big guns on one ship. You could then sit at long range and destroy your lesser enemies with many armour-piercing heavy shells. But such a ship would be so powerful that all the existing battleships would be obsolete overnight. If you had invested a lot into your battleship fleet, that was a lot of money to throw down the drain. And throwing money down the drain tends to make people very upset. The last generation of what would later be called pre-dreadnoughts began to upscale their secondary guns, but this was a halfway step that wasn't a very good idea. The secondary guns had different ballistic performance, and now the shell splashes were similar enough, it was hard to tell which shot came from which gun. Yeah, great move. Didn't really think that one through, did you guys? Eventually, the United States and Japan decided to build ships of this type, the South Carolina and the Satsuma, respectively. So why did we not all end up sailing in Carolinas or Satsumas? Well, the second one would have sounded a bit stupid anyway. But at the start of the 20th century, Britain was the top sea dog, and Admiral Fisher had decided they would have one first. Although the Royal Navy was slightly slower to design an old big gun battleship, British shipyards were incredibly experienced at building lots of warships, and Fisher had a big budget. He put the dockyards to work night and day, even stealing gun turrets from the last Royal Navy pre-dreadnoughts under construction. This made them a little bit sad, because it meant they had to wait for replacements, and were then obsolete as soon as they were launched. Anyway, because of this, the Dreadnought was launched before the other nation ships on the 10th of February 1906, only four months after being laid down, and was fitted out and commissioned by the end of the year. The Dreadnought included a number of other advances. She was the first big warship with turbine engines, which made her faster, and she could keep up this speed for long distances. The earlier reciprocating engines were not as efficient, slower, and tended to shake themselves apart if you kept going at full speed for any considerable length of time. She also carried an early form of mechanical fire control computer to help aim and fire her guns. The guns themselves were 12-inch weapons in five twin turrets, one at the front, one on each side, and two at the back. In theory, this meant it could fire six guns at targets ahead of it, or eight guns at a target in any other arc. However, this gun layout was not as efficient as the one on the South Carolina, which could offer the same broadside, but needed one less turret. But more on that on its own video. But here's a picture of it for the moment. There was a light secondary armament of 3-inch guns to deal with torpedo boats, which were new at the time, but because some things never get old, it also carried five torpedo tubes and had a ram bow in the front. Her existence caused a naval arms race to begin, with the United States, Japan, Germany and Britain racing to build bigger and better dreadnoughts. Other countries like France, Italy, Russia, Austria-Hungary, and even Chile, Greece, Spain, Argentina and Brazil also either built their own or ordered them from bigger countries. Having a dreadnought was like the 1900s version of having an iPhone. It was big, shiny, probably unnecessary, and likely to be superseded within a few years, but unlike an iPhone, you could blast your enemies into submission with lots of explosives, and the warranty was not voided in the mere presence of water. So there is that. At under £2 million, it was also cheaper than some iPhones, so I think I would prefer a dreadnought for my money, as you can't make friends and oppress people using an iPhone.
Ironically for such a game-changing ship, the Dreadnought missed the Battle of Jutland in 1916, which was the biggest clash of Dreadnought battleships ever. Because so many more battleships had been built that were be bigger and better armed, she was then sent to lead a group of pre-Dreadnoughts on coastal defence duty instead of staying with the main fleet for most of the rest of the war. It wasn't all bad news though. In 1915 she spotted the submarine U-29, which had just fired a torpedo. The captain decided it would be a good to put that ram bow to good use, and charged forward, only just avoiding the Temeraire, whose captain had had the same idea. I wonder if anyone had actually thought about just shooting it? But needless to say, the fight between a submersible tin can and a battleship designed to ram much bigger opponents was somewhat one-sided, and the Dreadnought cut the U-29 in two, thus becoming the only battleship to deliberately sink a submarine in combat. After World War I, Britain was more than a little broke, and had more battleships than it knew what to do with. So, only 15 years after she was built, the Dreadnought was scrapped without much ceremony, which was a bit of a shame. But her name lived on in both the Royal Navy and in common language. Many big things are often called Dreadnought to emphasise their size and potency. The Royal Navy continued the name with its first nuclear submarine, and the successor to the Vanguard ballistic missile submarine will also be called HMS Dreadnought. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.